up, family? Good to see you. How are you today? Come on. Are you excited to be in the house of God? I'm excited to be here as well. Uh, excited to continue our uh, series on discipleship that we've done. As uh, Pastor Owen said, that people are already responding, opening up their homes. I mean, you're going to eat a meal after this anyways. Just do one thing. Don't eat it alone. Invite someone that you don't know. Invite someone that you want to know. You know, if you're single and you want to know someone, invite them to a meal. It's how it works. I know in this digital age, you know, you just, that needs to be taught, you know. Uh, it's not caught, unfortunately. It has to be taught. So praise God. So uh, don't eat alone. You're going to eat anyway. So uh, share our life. Share the table. Uh, I love uh, one of my, my favorite highlights from last week's uh, message on discipleship. Roman said that, that Jesus decided to reveal his power and glory through a meal. That the, the communion meal actually represents himself. Like he is the body and the cup, his blood and his body, and he chose to reveal his glory and majesty through a meal. Why? Because a meal is something that we're going to do every single day anyways, and he wants to be a part of every single day, all day, three times a day, and all day long, right? So he's decided to put, to hide himself and reveal himself in the mystery of just like eating a meal together. So I love that. That was so, so good. Um, if you've enjoyed this discipleship series, uh, I have. I uh, just want to do a quick recap, actually. So we've done already three parts of this. We started off with Dylan, and he talked about um, discipleship, and, and his message was a friend of sinners. And uh, super, super incredible message, but w w one of the th thoughts was that the Jesus, the last words that he says was the Great Commission. And the last thing someone says, pretty important, and, uh, and the commission was this, that every single believer is called to make disciples. It's not just for the elite, it's not just for those in ministry, it's not just for pastors, it's not just for people that can speak. All believers are called to make disciples, amen? So, and, and then the other key point there was that it's not just discipling just believers, but actually, what if we reached out and started to disciple non-believers that don't know Jesus, amen? So that was a powerful message. Thank you, Dylan, for that. A uh, couple of times we've heard from Pastor Roman talk about uh, discipleship as well. The first one was called uh, Make Room, Make room. You guys can check that out on our YouTube channel if you, if you didn't listen to it. So good. We, it was like, it was so short and packed. And then he reviewed it again last week. Um, and then uh, we talked about discipleship community. But make room was about God is actually breathing on our homes for this move of God. Not just in corporate settings, not just in a church, not just in buildings, but it's, it's left the church, it's going to homes. Uh, in the early church, the revival was they met in the temple and house to house. And so that was a message that was powerful about breaking bread, about uh, ho uh, ho hosting a culture and an environment of koinonia. The Greek original word there is koinonia, uh, which means like, I mean, it, it's a deep word, but it, it really means like an exchange. It means a sharing. It means a participation together. Uh, it's hard in English to have one word. There's like seven really great English words that describe this one deep uh, uh, original word, in the Greek language, but hosting koinonia and breaking bread in our homes. And then last week, discipleship community, one of the best messages I've heard on discipleship ever. You have to check it out if you missed it, or if you didn't, just listen to it again um, on our YouTube uh, channel. And so this has been an uh, incredible series. I wanna continue to lay some foundations and the next week uh, in part two, I wanna make it like extremely practical. And so today we'll do some foundational stuff. I wanna show you this incredible uh, model and structure and, and, and pattern that I see in scripture about discipleship. And then we'll get really, really practical with it uh, next week. So buckle up, let's dive in and uh, let's become a discipleship community. Let's become a community of believers that come around the table and, and are in, at the table, who do we come around? The table is not just empty. It's not just a meal like in the world, but actually we come around the table of the Lord and the table, and he is the elements on the table. He is the one that we partake of. He's the one we eat. So there's a difference between just coming around a table and then actually for a community of believers to come around a table and partake of Jesus, partake of one another, okay? So there's some spiritual elements there. Um, uh, today, I really wanna cover three quick things. I wanna talk about why discipleship, what discipleship, and then like, what are the, the three fundamental elements of discipleship? You could boil all the scriptures on discipleship. Um, I, I went through every single instance of discipleship or disciple or disciples, and I looked at everything the Bible would have to say about it, and everything fits into three distinct things. And so that's what I wanna look at today. So why discipleship? What is discipleship? And then what's the three fundamental parts? If you could boil it all down to three things, 
This is what discipleship is. If you only have one of them, it's not discipleship. If you have two, it's not. But if you have three, then you have real discipleship. You guys ready to dive in today? Okay, come on, let's do it. So let's start with number one, why discipleship? Uh, Why discipleship? Before we do that, we just invite you, Holy Spirit, for this not to just be information, but would you come and teach us and transform us? Let us eat at your table today, God. Let it be today that you are the host and we're in your living room and it's your table and you're feeding us of yourself, of your body, of your blood, of the cup and the bread that is you. We want to partake of you that we may have life. This is eternal life that we may know you, encounter you and experience you. And so, God, we can't just get this as a teaching. We have to get this as an impartation. And so we open ourselves up and we say, teach us, almighty teacher, You are our teacher, in Jesus' name, amen. So why discipleship? It's interesting, I mean, Jesus is the wisdom of God. God is wise, he, wisdom is him, right? There's there's nothing more incredible than the wisdom of God. And God, in all of his wisdom, when God became a man and took on flesh and said, you know what, I'm gonna have a ministry for only three years on the earth, how can I make the greatest impact that's gonna transform the world and shift society and shift culture forever. By the way, Jesus did that. If you even think about it, like our whole calendar is centers and is divided on Jesus. Like you have, you have before Christ and then you have Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. And the center of all of history, the center of all of culture, the center of everything is Jesus Christ. He in three years made such an impact that the whole world has been shaken at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In three years. So God in all of his wisdom was gonna pack three years of ministry that was gonna shift the whole world. How did he do it? Well, Jesus didn't decide to open up a church and get the biggest stadium and the biggest boat and the biggest whatever building that was available in that day. He actually chose to personally make disciples. He took the three years of his ministry and he called people to himself and he spent time with them. There was 12 that got to be three years with Jesus everywhere he went. And he did discipleship different than uh, the culture of the day because the Jewish culture, one of the primary things of their culture was a discipleship culture, especially with like the religious culture with the rabbis and the Pharisees and all that kind of stuff. They had a disciple type of a culture, but Jesus took it and broke the norms and did it completely differently because their disciples didn't change the world. But Jesus, through three years of discipleship, has absolutely transformed the world. So why discipleship? Because the wisdom of God and the strategy of heaven says that this is the best thing that you could do to change the world. Can I tell you, the wisdom of heaven and the strategy of heaven, it works. It still works today. We don't need to pull out any new tricks. We just need to do what Jesus demonstrated and commissioned us to do. So the first thing is he personally chose to make disciples and to focus his entire ministry primarily on making those disciples. That was the primary focus of Jesus. Yes, he did some sermons and we have them recorded. But if you think about it, like not like he didn't primarily do sermons. We would have a lot more writing of Jesus's words, but like there's a limited amount of Jesus's words that are recorded because what he lived and how he lived with them was the primary part of his life. So why discipleship? Jesus did it. Number two, Jesus's strategy to transform the world was, was the great commission. And he said, listen, I'm gonna go, but I'm not gonna leave you alone. I'm not gonna leave you as orphans. I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit. Now I'm sending you. So I came and did it with you. Now I'm sending you, go and do the same thing. And then what was the Great Commission? By the way, statistics about the Great Commission are horrible. Most Christians, less than 25% of Christians even know what the Great Commission is. Uh, Less than 50% of Christians have even heard this word. That's weird to me. I mean, this is like the last commission and command of Jesus on the earth. And the Great Commission, let's just read it real quick. I know Dylan did a great job in Friend of Sinners on that, but let's dive into it for a second there. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Matthew 28, the last three verses in Matthew. Go therefore and make disciples of nations. This is as Jesus is right about to ascend, the last thing that he says on the earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. And then as you go and make disciples, you're doing, you go make disciples by baptizing them and teaching them. So part of the making of the disciples was baptizing and teaching, but the main crux of it all was go and make disciples. Not just go, but go and make disciples. 
Now, to make a disciple, you first actually have to make a convert. So within discipleship is everything else. Within discipleship is already evangelism. Within discipleship is already growing up into maturity. Within discipleship is already Christ-likeness. It's already doing what Jesus did. Within the package of discipleship is everything that Jesus taught, did, and manifested. So it's not just like, hey, like the main thing on the earth is evangelism. Uh, kind of, it's actually discipleship and included in that package. Of course, we have to reach people before we disciple them. So this is Jesus' strategy on the earth. So why discipleship? I mean, if we don't think discipleship's important, we're absolutely diminishing the wisdom of God and what Jesus chose to do on the earth. If we don't think discipleship's important. Discipleship is the wisdom of God and the strategy of heaven. No new tricks, this is it, okay? So let's take a look at the statistics of where the church is at and the need for discipleship real quick. Over one million young people will leave the church every year for the next, so there's a study done that by 2050, there'll be about 35 or 45 million young people only, so this is Gen Z, that will leave the faith. So one million a year is the average. It's a little over one million a year. 67% of young people, kids, will lose their faith in college when all of a sudden the storms of life and philosophies and whatever else, this culture starts to infiltrate them and they're no longer under the covering of mom and dad. When they become independent, statistics say 67, like walk away from the faith completely. And those that were like, and some don't walk away from the faith, but they, the, the, their faith struggles and they're shaken. They say that only 4% of people that have grown up Christian, when they go to college, that they maintain a strong connection to the Lord personally and to the church. Only 4%. And what's common among all 4% is all of them have someone that's mentoring and leading and discipling them. Isn't that interesting? The 4% that make it are being discipled. And the 96% that don't are not being discipled. They think that being a Christian is enough, being in a Christian home is enough, going to a church is enough. Well, it's not. The statistics show that. 80% of people who attend evangelical churches in America don't even have a biblical worldview. You, you start to ask them the foundations of the fundamentals of the biblical stuff and they're like, I don't know, no, I don't, think that's, I don't think that's wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. 80% of people don't have a biblical worldview. What's the problem? We have a discipleship problem. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Don't just make converts and Christians and just make big gatherings where Christians come together and you have really great community. Community groups are awesome, but it's not just about community. It's actually about sharing together, coming around the table of the Lord, partaking of Jesus. So my first point today, why discipleship? Jesus did it. Jesus commanded us to do it. And there's a major need in our world. Amen? Are you, are you picking up what I'm throwing down? Okay, let's do it. So now let's talk about what is discipleship. And then we'll get into the, the heart of, of today's conversation, which is the fundamental aspects of it. So what is discipleship? Let's take a look at this original word real quick. So in the Greek language, when you come across this word, it's the word uh, mathetis, uh, and it means this. It means several different things, but the common thing with every single definition is a follower and a learner. So it's a, 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 th this word, it means a disciple or a student, an apprentice, a follower, a committed learner. In the New Testament, this word is almost exclusively used of Jesus' disciples. So yes, it talks about like John's disciples and even the Pharisees' disciples, but that's more rare. In the New Testament, the primary majority of these words are connected to the disciples of Jesus. Okay, so someone who follows and learns from a teacher, a rabbi, you know, whoever their leader is, right? So it's, it's, it's one who follows one's teaching. So following and learning, following and learning. Say that together with me. Following and learning, that's essentially what a disciple is. It's a committed follower and a committed learner, okay? So in Jewish culture, discipleship was all about those two things, following and learning a teacher or rabbi. A disciple was a student who studied the teachings of the rabbi and then sought to become like him. So ultimately there was, uh, in, in the Jewish culture and religion, it, you know, and it wasn't just about learning information or doctrines, but really a disciple had a very deep commitment because what they would do is they would actually, they would, uh, you know, suspend whatever they were doing and they would go and become a learner, a follower and would cling to like a teacher, a master, a rabbi. Uh, and then what they would do is they would follow them. They would learn everything that they said. They would like really listen carefully to their teaching. So they would follow them, listen carefully to their teacher and then try to do exactly what they did. They would try to become like them. The three elements of like, in the Jewish culture, that's what they wanted to do. You had to follow, listen carefully to their instruction and then mimic them, imitate them. Imitate their actions. 
what's interesting is that in contrast, Jesus did discipleship actually a whole, like he did it at a whole nother level and differently. So Jesus, for three years, he actually lived with his disciples. His disciples lived with them. They didn't just follow him, listen to his teaching and mimic him, although that happened. He did it at such a different level because the religious ones, they would kind of give time for like their students. Be like, okay, like, you know, come to class. Now it's like rabbi school, you know, come. It was kind of almost like their job. And then they would leave and then they would go home and do the rest of their life. So discipleship for the Jewish, in the Jewish community and culture was like a part of their day. It was almost like you go to my school. It was almost like scholastic. It wasn't actually life on life. They didn't actually come and sit at the table of. It was, they didn't get integrated into the family of. It was like master and, 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 and student. It was like, I'm superior, you're, you know, you're inferior, and, but, and I'm gonna lord it over you. That's why even Jesus said, hey, with you, it has to be different. He was fighting against the models of the discipleship that they had of their day. He said, with you, like, don't lord it over them like the rulers do and the Pharisees do and the religious leaders do. No, no, no. Whoever wants to be the greatest has to be the least and the servant of all. So Jesus said, I, your teacher and Lord, have come and washed your feet. I've invited you to my table. I've broken the bread for you. I've brought you into my home. I've made you a part of my family. He says, I no longer call you servants in John 15, I believe. But he says, I have called you friends because I want to tell you everything. So there was a whole different level of discipleship. And actually this word disciple has now become like an exclusively Christian term because of the way Jesus demonstrated, it broke the model and the mold of the culture of that day. So discipleship evolved because Jesus is like, you know what, let me show you. You know, you, you guys have this like master teach, you know, teacher and like student kind of relationship. Let me show you what it's actually supposed to look like and how it'll actually transform someone's life. Because it's not about sitting in a classroom and receiving instruction. Sometimes that's what we think it is. And we find that like someone studies for 12 years, they go through first through 12th grade, kindergarten through 12th grade, and then they graduate college for four years. And then you ask them what they learned, they're like, I don't even know. And they say that in college, even like high school and college, you don't really learn, you just, you learn how to study more than you learn what you're learning. So ultimately the system of education that we have does not really do a great job. But what it does is actually the structure forms people into someone that can maybe, if they take those tools, can be sustained throughout life. But ultimately like the way that we do learning isn't the effective way. Jesus in three years was able to shift culture and society because he did the learning differently than the rest of culture. Are you getting this? Okay, so very, very important there. So Check out when Jesus calls his disciples, his invitation, look at how the, even the words that he uses. Look at Matthew chapter four, verse 19. He said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Like right now you fish for fish. I'm gonna teach you how to catch the real treasure, which is people, souls. And it, I'll show you how to make an eternal difference. You want, you want to make a temporary difference in your business? I'll show you how to make an eternal difference. Follow me. But what was the invitation of Jesus? Follow me. It wasn't like, hey, like try to be like me. No, it was follow me. A disciple of Jesus, first and foremost, is a follower and is a learner. Look at Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and 29. This is what he says to his followers. He says, come to me. Everyone who's weary, everyone who's burdened, have you been weary? Have you been burdened in your life? Jesus' invitation, come follow me. Because if you follow me, I'm not gonna be like the teachers of his day, of Jesus' day, who were, who were tough, who were hard, who put more pressure on them. He said, come to me. This is a contrast. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Look at this. This is the second part of a disciple, learn. So the first part of a disciple was in Matthew 4, follow me here, learn from me. I'm gentle, I'm humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You'll find salvation for your souls. You will find transformation for your souls. So Jesus said, follow me and learn from me. So what's a disciple? A follower and a learner. Why disciple? That's what Jesus did. And that's what Jesus said to do. And there's a major need in our culture and society. What is discipleship? a follower and a learner unto Christ-likeness. I love how Dylan said it. He said that uh, discipleship is friendship unto maturity in Christ or unto Christ-likeness. Friendship unto maturity. Love it. Beautiful. Um, 
discipleship is always about following Jesus. If you look through these passages, uh, actually, let's take a look at one more passage, but t- take a note here. We'll go back to these, but take a look at John 8, 31. To the Jews who had believed in him, so there were some Jews that were listening to Jesus' teaching. They were following him, and they were listening to his teachings, and they believed in him, but it wasn't enough. Look what he said. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. That means if you actually stay with my teaching, you don't just like, you know, come where I come and like you listen, but you actually receive and hold my teaching because these were already believers, right? He said, you're not a disciple because you believed. You're a disciple if you remain in my teaching, remain in my word, hold to my teaching. So do you know that there's believers that are not disciples? Because w- w- what does it take to be, to be saved, to have eternal life? Just believe. John 6, 29 says, this is the only work God wants from you, to believe in his son. Whoever believes in his son will never perish, will never be condemned, but they'll have eternal life. So salvation is pretty easy. Eternal life is pretty easy. But there's a whole other level of actually intimacy, relationship, and entering into the kingdom of God that's different than salvation. There's a lot of requirements about entering the kingdom of God. Salvation only by believing. Entering the kingdom of God? Man, I think it's like 30. I'm like doing currently a study on it. Did you know that entering the kingdom of God is not the same as salvation? Because a disciple of Jesus makes Jesus their Lord, not just their Savior. Because you can make Jesus your Savior because you believed in him, and then just do your own thing. But when you make Jesus your Lord, you enter into the kingdom of God, into the domain where Jesus is king. Because he's king wherever he rules and reigns. So is he king in your life or is he just savior? And there's a huge difference even in the future, in eschatology, in in, in the next age to come and then the eternal age. Your status, your position, and what your eternity will look like determines whether Jesus is just savior or Lord. There's a big difference in those. Huge. So there's like three options when it comes to the eternal age. There's utter destruction, the lake of fire. There is... You have eternal life, and so you're saved, so you're in eternity with Jesus, and then there's actually the bride that he returns for and spends a year with, which is a thousand years. A year, because that, that's what they did in the Jewish culture. And Jesus was a Jew, and he modeled a lot of this stuff out of the, after that. So, but the, the, the first resurrection of the dead is not for all believers. I don't believe. Anyways, this is another teaching I can't get into right now. It's actually for those, it's like, you know the 10 virgins? All of them were virgins. All of them wanted the bridegroom. All of them had lamps. All of them had oil in their lamps. But only five were taken when the bridegroom came. The other five were not not saved. They didn't go into utter destruction and darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. It doesn't say anything like that. They just didn't go on the honeymoon because oil speaks of intimacy Because there's those that make Jesus their Lord and there's those that just believe in him. Discipleship is important because we have to go from just making people Christians to actually, to there's in all the parables of Jesus. Man, I wasn't planning on touching this. I'm just, I've been doing this study for like two months now and it's just blowing my mind. And uh, if you look at all the parables of Jesus, when he invites people to the feast, there's the king and his bride because it's a wedding feast. And the king is Jesus and there's a bride at the feast. But there's also all the guests of the bridegroom. And there's a difference in the kingdom of God in the final eternal age between the bride and the guests of the bridegroom. Believers and disciples of Jesus. He said to those who believed in him, If you hold my teaching, you'll be my disciples. So there's an if to being a disciple. There's no if to being saved. Just believe. There's an if to entering the kingdom. Those who do this and this and this will never enter the kingdom of God. Wait, so now we're preaching works? No, no, no. The kingdom of God and salvation are two completely different things according to scripture. Go check out the study. Might release it here soon. Praise God. We got got to move briskly on here. Okay, so discipleship is about actually making Jesus your Lord, not just Savior. It's so important. It makes a significant difference 
it'll even determine which resurrection you're a part of. And your, your total eternity, whether you live in the city or outside the city in the New Jerusalem with Jesus. Major stuff, major, major stuff. I don't wanna just be saved. I wanna be with my king. I wanna be in the chambers with my king. I wanna be the bride. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. So really quickly, let's take a look at these three verses again. So let's go back to Matthew 4, and then we'll look at Matthew 11 and John 8. Go to Matthew 4, two slides back. Look, it says, follow me. The crux of this is that discipleship is not just about following a person. It's actually about following Jesus. You remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, I believe? He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Meaning like, if I don't follow Christ, don't follow me there. Follow me only as I follow Christ. So following people is okay if they're going into the main destination, which is Jesus. Because you can't be grandfathered in to relationship with Jesus. You know that Jesus has no grandkids? He only has kids. You can't like come in through someone else. Like, oh, like I know your dad, so fine, you can come in too. There's no such a thing in the kingdom. You actually have to be his you actually have to be his disciple. He has to be your Lord. Not your parents have him as Lord. Praise God. So follow me and I'll make you disciples of men. So our Christian activity and discipleship is not to lead people to us. It's to lead people to him. Hopefully we're on our way to him too. So as we're leading people with us, we're leading them to him, never to us. Well, things become a cult when we lead people to ourselves and when we become God. But things stay solid and straight when we lead people to Jesus. Amen? So the invitation is always about following Jesus. Jesus is the teacher. Um, even the disciples of John the Baptist, they were, came and they were complaining like, John, John, like, you know, this Jesus guy that you like baptize and stuff, he's baptizing more people than us. And he's like, duh, I told you I'm not the Christ. And he even says this in, in, uh, in John chapter 3, verse 30, he says, he must become greater, I must decrease. So John, under inspiration, had the revelation that Jesus was the Christ. But then why in the world did he still have disciples? I believe, I mean, this is a crazy thought and idea, but I believe that because, like, Andrew and one of the other disciples, I forget the two names, who? Philip and Andrew, they were disciples of John first. And then when John said, this is the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God who takes to the Savior of the world, they're like, oh, that's the one we've been waiting for? And they switched over and they became disciples of Jesus. Now, my question is, why didn't the rest of John's disciples and John himself lay down his ministry? Because John's assignment was to prepare the way for him. Well, he showed up and started his ministry. So what are you doing now, John? I believe John, the greatest prophet, because he introduced Jesus, became so disoriented, ended up in jail, and ended up coming to Jesus and questioning whether he was even the Messiah. Why? Because instead of becoming a disciple of Jesus, he continued his ministry. Could it be that John didn't have to die, but he just continued his ministry when actually the ministry of Jesus started? Because some of the disciples, they started to follow Jesus. But then the other disciples are like, hey, there's this Jesus guy, like, and then he says it right, but why not do it, John? Wouldn't you want to be the disciple of the Messiah? What in the world are you doing building your ministry when the Messiah's ministry is being built? And he starts to continue. He continues to build it. He gets so disoriented in prison. He's so discouraged. He doesn't even believe his own prophecies that Jesus is the Messiah. Are you the one or should we wait for another? Man. And, that, and then Jesus, John's beheaded and Jesus is grieving. I believe part of Jesus is grieving. He's like, John, like you introduced me, but man, what happened? He was part of one move of God, but it's hard to transition and be part of the next move of God. And the previous move of God will typically question and shut down the next one. Ah, anyways, that's an aside. Okay, well, well, we gotta jump into no, number three. So number one is why discipleship? Number two is what is discipleship? Follow and learn. And it's about following Jesus. And let's talk about the fundamentals of discipleship. This is the most important part. This is where I wanna spend some time. Fundamentals of discipleship. Like if you look through some scriptures, like go to the slide right before this. I think it has like eight. I just threw like about 25 scriptures or so on the side there. I just went through like, what are the requirements of a disciple? What is a disciple in scripture? And right there, like they follow Jesus, 
They learn from Jesus. They love God. They love others. They obey his commandments. They endure suffering and hardship because Jesus said, they persecuted me, they're gonna persecute you, you know? Uh, shared, they shared the gospel. He, he sent them to preach the gospel and he sent them to make disciples. He, he said, if you don't lay down your life, pick up your cross, give up all your possessions, you can't be my disciple. If you don't hate your family, you can't be my disciple. Whoa, I mean, dang. If you're really my disciple, you'll bear fruit and bear fruit and prove to be my disciple. So there's a lot of things that a disciple did. But if you look at this whole entire list, I mean, it's long. I only threw like eight kind of common ones in there. Uh, we could go a lot further, but the thing is, is if you take all of these, you can ultimately boil it down to three things. And these three things really show you what a disciple is. And without all three, you don't have a disciple. Let's take a look at them real quick. Let's take a look at these three things. Number one, a disciple is a person that Jesus calls to himself and it's about him. So let's go there. First one is presence. Check out Mark. So I'm gonna draw a circle there on my whiteboard. Whew. Presence, there it is. Uh, check out Mark chapter three, verse 14. And he appointed 12 so that they would be with him. The primary call of every single disciple is to be with Jesus. Discipleship is about being with him before anything else. And actually there's an order to this. Because if you do it out of order, all of a sudden everything will get mixed up. So how do you know if you're a disciple? Number one, do you want to be with him? And are you with him? Is, what does your time look like? What does your day look like? What does the rhythm of your life look like? Do you want him and do you wanna be with him? It starts there. If you don't start there, just end it all. It's not worth it. Like, you're not a disciple. By end it all, that don't mean in, in, in a bad way, you know? So <laughs> hear me right, okay? Praise God. Someone's gonna clip it and be like, Vic preaches this. You know, it's like, no, it's not true. Get the whole clip, you know? <laughs> okay, praise God. So presence is being with Jesus. Say being with Jesus. Discipleship is about being with Jesus. He appointed the 12 so that they would be with him. And then of course he sent them out to preach, but that is not the primary thing of a disciple. Again, remember, even in the Jewish culture, they would first come and they would sit at the feet of, they would learn from, they would follow, they would just be with them, okay? So that's the first and, and primary thing. The second thing, so I'll lay the foundation down and we'll, we'll dig into these a little more. The second thing that a disciple is, is now, I'm, I'm gonna use these words now, these three like words actually borrowed from uh, John Tyson. He's one of the best pastors and teachers in the world. And so I borrowed this, these three circle model from him. But the idea is there all throughout scripture and I've seen it through many different discipleship books and manuals and materials and even myself said it also, but then I was like, oh, this is a really cool, cute way to put it. So take a look at the second circle. So show, show that slide. So you have presence and then you have what we call formation. Formation is the process of becoming like the teacher. So first you're with the teacher, Jesus, and then you become like him. You're being formed into his image and into his likeness because whoever you're with, you become like. So take a look at the second one, formation, being like Jesus, okay? Let's take a look at the, the verses there. Discipleship is not about teaching but it's about reproducing and becoming. So go to the next slide there with formation. Where it says formation and then it has a couple things there. Here we go. Matthew chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. A disciple is not above his teacher. It is enough for the disciple to become like his teacher. So formation has to do with being like Jesus. Presence, being with Jesus. Formation, being like Jesus. What is discipleship about? To be with him and to be like him to be with him and to be like him. Let's say that together. To be with him and to be like him. A disciple is not above his teacher. It's enough for the disciple to become like his teacher. Now, Jesus was talking really about himself as the teacher here. It's enough for you to become like me. A disciple can't go above the one that they're being discipled by. That's why it's important that you don't just have human disciples, but Jesus is your, disciple, is, is your teacher. Because you'll never supersede who you're following. That's what Jesus said. You'll never go above who you're following. And it actually says in a similar passage, uh, in Luke chapter six, verse 40, it says, a disciple is not above his teacher, similar statement. But then look, it says, everyone when he's fully trained will be like his teacher. I don't think I have that verse, but it's Luke six forty. So a parallel passage, when a student is fully trained, they become exactly like their teacher. So you will always become like the one that you're following. So if you look in the mirror and you see who you are, well, that's because that's who you're following. 
because whoever you follow, you become like. You'll become fully trained into their image. Okay? So take a look at this. 1 John 2, 6. Whoever claims to live in him, in Jesus, must live as Jesus did. What is our calling? To become like Jesus. To be formed into his image and likeness. I mean, there's many passages about it. We'll look at one more. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God. <laughs> Children of God, be imitators of God. Why? You're a child of God. So if you follow God, you're supposed to act like God. You're supposed to be just like your father. You're supposed to be generous like your father, loving like your father, forgiving like your father, like your father. Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved. Imitators of God as Christ. Amen? So what's the second thing? It's formation. I love this quote by Dallas Willard, he says this, discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. So discipleship is when you become like Jesus would be if he were you. Because you're unique, you're created in a unique way, but if Jesus were you, what would you become? That's what discipleship is. Discipleship is the process of becoming who you would be, who Jesus would be if he were you. Now, Dallas Willard is addressing one-third of discipleship here. He's addressing formation. He's not addressing necessarily, I mean, presence. Although, if Jesus were you, he would also be very intimate with the Father. So maybe within formation, you have a little bit of presence there as well. And within formation, you probably have a little bit of the third one as well. But the idea is, is that I want to separate these two things into, these, these things into three different things. Why? Because there's a pattern of three in Scripture that speaks of like, even like a fullness and a maturity. Uh, not as seven speaks of like a per perfection unto maturity. Three speaks of this like this triunity and, 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 and incredible. So we'll look at that in just a moment there. But a dis so, so discipleship is a lifelong commitment. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen in a classroom. It doesn't happen in a church service. Discipleship is life on life. Whoever you walk with, you become like. Whoever you spend time with, you become like. Discipleship is about who you're becoming, not what you're doing discipleship is about who you are, not what you do. Discipleship is about who you're becoming. Say it again. Discipleship is about who you're becoming, right? I love this quote by Howard Hendricks. You teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. You teach what you know. You reproduce who you are. So who you are will actually be imparted to someone else. So be careful who you follow because you'll become just like your teacher when you're fully trained. Okay, the third part of this three elements of discipleship is mission. Let's take a look at that, mission. And this is about doing what Jesus did. So the top one, presence, is about being like Jesus. Formation, uh, sorry, being with Jesus, presence. Formation, being like Jesus. And then mission, doing what Jesus did or partnering with God on the earth. You know that God is looking for co-laborers and partners on the earth, that God has decided in his sovereignty that he will do his activity on the earth through partnering with man. He doesn't wanna do it for you as a good father. He wants to do it with you as a good father because a good father doesn't wanna be stuck doing stuff for their children all, all, for the rest of their life. That would just mean you're an infant and can do nothing on your own. But he wants to do it with you. So God in his divinity and his sovereignty and his majesty and his wisdom has decided to do his activity on the earth with partnership with man. Amen. So watch this, John 13, 15. I have set an example so that you should do as I have done for you. I've set an example, do as I have done. So now we're talking about mission. So notice the different elements where Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's talking about being with the Father and Jesus even modeled that. He would go away. It says in John, I mean in Mark 1, 31, I believe. He says, early in the morning, while it was still dark, he would get up, go away to a solitary place, an isolated, quiet place, and pray. Here's Jesus who modeled what it was like to be a disciple of the Father, had his own disciples, and then commissioned us to make disciples. Amen? So Jesus was with the Father. He was, he was being formed, right? Jesus grew. Do you know Jesus was being formed as well? There's three different scriptures that say that. Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and man. Jesus grew, right? He matured. It says in Hebrews that Jesus learned obedience. You can't learn something if you know it from birth. <laughs> he learned obedience. Jesus had to be formed. And it pleased, he pleased God. Why? His formation and journey and process pleased the Father. 
and then mission, what Jesus began to do. So 30 years of formation, three years of mission, a 10 to one ratio. Sometimes what we want is three seconds of formation and then instant mission (laughs) called Instagram. You know, I'll tell you my mission. I'm going to be an Insta. (laughs) Okay. These days, people don't even know Instagram. It's like TikTok and probably the next thing already that's out there. You know, be real and whatever else. Just um, Look at what John 14, 12 says. Truly I say to you, the one who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do and greater works than these he will do because I'm going to the Father. The things that the Father does, we're supposed to do as well and even greater works. We won't talk about what the greater works are right now. There's some incredible revelation on that, but... Everything Jesus did, you can also do. Remember 1 John 2, 6? Whoever claims to live in God must live exactly like Jesus did. So if you are not doing, if you are not intimate with the Father like Jesus, and you're not like Jesus in every way, and you're not doing his works, don't make an excuse, I'm just human. (laughs) So was Jesus. Yeah, he was fully divine, but he was fully human. And in his humanity, he pleased God. Why? How could Jesus be an example to us? Multiple times he said, follow my example. Well, if he's God, we can't. I mean, he is God, but if he's acting in his divinity on the earth, we can't. But in his humanity, he says, follow me. This is my example. Do as I did. And you will do the works that I do. So everything Jesus demonstrated on the earth is available to us. So we need to, we need to stop making excuses that we can't do what Jesus did. We actually must live like Jesus did, amen? Um, Okay, so true discipleship must have all three of these elements. True discipleship must have all three of the elements. If you have only part of it, you have something totally different. So let's just say that you just have presence. Now, I know a lot of like people that are all about the presence. I know a lot of ministries and even, you know, places and, 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 and prayer rooms and whatever else is awesome, but they're all about the presence, all about the Lord, ministry to the Lord, which is awesome. It's one third of the package, it's one third of discipleship. But if you just have presence, what you end up with is hyper-spirituality. Where it's like everything is hyper-spiritual, like everything is like out there and these people become super weird because they don't, they're not being formed into the image of God and they're not touching the world and so they're like, they're unrelatable Then no one can ever be like them. But Jesus, he would show up And the sinners and the tax collectors and all the worst of the worst, they wanted to be around him. Jesus was not hyper-spiritual. He was a perfect blend of the triunity of a great disciple. He was intimate with the Father, but he wasn't hyper-spiritual. Now there's like even movements and organizations that are just like all about the presence and about the swirl and about that. Awesome, it's one third of God, you know? Great, it's one third of discipleship. But if you just teach someone to get caught up into a swirl, they're gonna be real swirly and they'll never be able to keep a job and they're just gonna swirl around their whole entire life. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Now, I'm not dogging the presence because that's primary, even in our community. We go after the presence, but it's not the only thing we go after. But we go after the presence. Now, presence is primary. So take a look at this next chart. It has all three of the things. And we're gonna analyze these different like circles and what happens if you just have one, a second, or the other. So if you just have presence, that's at the top, you have hyper-spirituality. What if you have just formation? Then you have spiritual narcissism. It's all about you. And it's all about, you know, self-help, looking inward, like how can I become better? How can I become a better person? Like, oh, I'm gonna read this book. I'm gonna add this to my life. If you just focus on formation without the presence of Jesus and without touching the world, you will have spiritual narcissism and you'll become so selfish and you'll do nothing. You won't look like Jesus actually. So on its own, even though be- formation is about becoming like Jesus, you will not look like Jesus because Jesus was all of it. The fullness of the Godhead was in Jesus. Amen? That's what it says. So if you just have formation, you are spiritually selfish and you live life for yourself. If you just have mission, there's some people, there are organizations, you know, churches, movements, whatever organizations, they're all about, you know, like, let's just help everyone get water, like clean water, you know, food, clothes. Awesome, but you have secular renewal. You're no different than any organization out there that doesn't care about God, doesn't care about becoming like God. They just wanna like help their neighbor. Great, but it's not the full gospel. See how like each one of these three things disconnected is not the full gospel? It's not fully Jesus. It's not all of him. It's a part of him. And people get into like, you know, secular renewal and social justice and all that kind of stuff. 
Is it a part of Jesus? Yes. Is it all of Jesus? No. The blend of the three is a disciple of Jesus because that's who Jesus is. Presence, formation, and mission. Now, what if you're like, okay, I, like I'm gonna focus on two of them. Let's say you have presence and formation. What you end up with is spiritual selfishness. So you're very spiritual, but it's all about you. More of me, more of God's presence for me. I just wanna, I wanna be with God and I wanna be formed. I wanna look like God. I wanna be with God. I wanna look like God. Cool, but you're still not effective on this world. Like, why are you on this world? Like, just be in eternity already. But you have spiritual selfishness. If you look at the, the, the bottom one, where if you have just formation and just mission, then you have social activism. So you, you're becoming a great person and then you're helping other people become great, you know? So it's like, you know, now we have like, you know, the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. It's like, cool, like I, I got free, like let me help you become free. But if you don't lead people to the presence of Jesus, there's not real transformation. So they end up 30 years later still saying, I am an. What the heck? Who told you that? Well, if you go to Jesus, he'll tell you that I am the I am, and that's not who you are, because that's not in me. <laughs> what do you mean, I am an alcoholic and I've been sober for 40 years? What in the garbage? It's because we have formation and mission, but no presence. Because <laughs> the Father is not an alcoholic sober for a billion years. <laughs> So why would you say something if you're a child of the Father that's not in, your, in the Father's identity? We don't label ourselves by our struggle or by our orientation. Well, I'm a blank Christian. It's like, no, because if that's not in Jesus, let's not make it our identity. Let's not call ourselves by something that's not in our Father because we're children of the Father. Now, that might be your struggle. That's okay. But don't call yourself by your struggle. Don't call yourself by your temptation. Don't call yourself that because whatever you say I am and put afterwards, be careful. It's going to start to manifest in your life. You're just calling out an identity. And it's not an identity of your father. So you're calling out a different identity that's not your father. Okay, we won't go off into that too much. And then if you have presence and mission, you have shallow servants. And that they burn out because they go, they get lit up in the presence and then they go on mission. They get lit up in the presence, they go on mission. But then they don't have any longevity because they're not formed and they're not like him. And so they quickly burn out and there's a shallowness and they blow in, blow up, and then blow out. <laughs> and that is just, you know, a bunch of blowing, you know, which is not good, you know. Blow in, blow up, blow out. <sighs> just a breath, here for a second, and gone the next. Praise God. So all together, presence, formation, mission is actually a disciple of Jesus. Now, it's interesting if you look at this pattern and parallel in scripture, Jesus, scripture, the Father, I mean, all of it, it centers around like three. I mean, it, it, there's a passage in Ecclesiastes that says that, um, let me find it real quick, Ecclesiastes 4.12, it says, though one, may, though one may be overpowered, like if you're by yourself, you can be overpowered. An isolated person seeks destruction. That's what scripture says in Proverbs. Two, they can maybe defend themselves, but three, that's not breaking. You know why a lot of marriages end in divorce? Because there's only two. Marriage is never meant to be two. It's meant to be you, your spouse, and Jesus. And if he's at the center of your marriage, that's not quickly broken. You wanna be quickly broken? Just make marriage two. Just be you and Jesus, your wife and Jesus, and then you together. Two, you might be able to defend yourself 50% of the time, but three, not quickly broken. That's why God does things in three. God is three. He's a triunity, it's the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And actually, go back to the, the, the map of the circles with all the words in there. If you even look at it, like the Father, the face of the Father, the Father in heaven, Jesus sought the Father, like the Father represents like presence, the presence of God. When he would fill the temple, he was, his, his manifest tangible presence of the Father of God was there in, in, in the tabernacle and in the temple. God the Father, the presence, we must have the Father. The formation is, relates to Jesus, the Son because we're formed into the image of likeness of him. He became a man and he grew. She showed up how, he showed us how to grow. The son represents formation. And then the mission represents the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm gonna send you the Holy Spirit and you're gonna, you're gonna have gifts of the Holy Spirit. You're gonna have fruit of the Holy Spirit. You're gonna have the power of the Holy Spirit. You're gonna have boldness. You're gonna have these signs and wonders follow you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's gonna be given to you. So the Holy Spirit is giving you to empower your mission. It's about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not just about the Father or about the Son, or about the Spirit. It's about all of them. It's about the fullness of the Godhead. 
in us. So discipleship is this threefold cord. It's this divine package from heaven. It's being with him. It's being like him. And it's about doing what Jesus did. Being with him, being like him and doing what Jesus did. Uh, it's interesting. I'll just do a couple more things and we're gonna end here. Second Corinthians 13, 14. Flash this passage up real quick. Second Corinthians 13, 14. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the doxology. It's the last verse of 2 Corinthians. It's the last thing Paul writes to the Corinthian church. And he finishes this off with this kind of like doxology. And he includes all the Trinity in there. Notice, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. And he connects a word to each of them. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what is grace? What is grace? It's the empowerment to be just like him because he's gonna form you into his image and he doesn't leave you without his grace. Grace empowers you to live and look just like Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you because I want you to be formed into the image of God and the love of God because what, the, what will the love of God do? It'll draw you to the presence. The love of God is where we encounter the presence of God. We need to be kissed by our Father. We need to encounter his love. We need to be baptized in his love. We need to be washed by his love. We need the love of the Father. That's the presence piece. You cannot be a good disciple unless you are kissed by the kisses of your Father and loved by him. Because you can't even love unless he first loves you. So we need the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be formed, to have empowerment to live like him. We must have the love of the Father to draw us to him, to have intimacy with him. And then we must have the koinonia, that word fellowship, it's not, the, it's not a good word. It's like one seventh of the revelation in that word. It means partnership of the Holy Spirit be with you all so that you can actually partner with him on the earth and he's not gonna leave you as orphans. You're not gonna be powerless. You're actually gonna accomplish everything he's called you to do. You can do the works of Jesus because of the partnership of the Holy Spirit. The partnership of the Holy Spirit in your life will empower you to do the works of Jesus. The grace of Jesus will empower you to be like him the partnership of the Holy Spirit will empower you to do what he did. The love of God will empower you to be intimate with him and love him. See the three elements? It's everywhere in scripture. I could show you several more examples. Let's just, for the sake of time, we're gonna end here. Let's just do the last one. We started with the Great Commission. Let's end with the Great Commission. You'll actually notice all three of these elements are in the Great Commission. Because when he says, go make disciples, he wants a whole disciple formed. So presence, formation, and mission are there. So go there. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go make disciples. What's that? That's mission. I'm sending you on the mission. Go make disciples. That's the mission. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teaching them. What's that? That's formation. Teach them to follow everything I ever told you. So teach them my words. Form them so that they look like me. Go make disciples form them to be like me, teach them everything I taught you. And guess what? I am always with you. My presence is with you. I will never leave you. I myself will go with you, my presence. So you have mission, formation, and presence all in the package of the Great Commission, making disciples. We don't wanna be a church that just, just only focuses on the presence because we don't wanna be hyper spiritual. <laughs> We wanna be spiritual, but we wanna be fully formed in the image of Christ. We don't wanna just be a church that just teaches. Now I know a lot of places that, man, they focus so good on teaching, but then people become, you know, what's the word there? Narcissistic, spiritually narcissistic. We don't wanna just send everyone without them being equipped and being with Jesus because then they're just gonna be doing secular renewal, social work. We're not just a church that activates social workers, but we need the presence of God. We need to be with him, to be like him and to partner with him on the earth. We need to be with him and to be like him and partner with him on the earth. I wanna be a disciple that has all three. Where in your life have you gone dry and weary and you feel like something's broken? Can I tell you, you might be missing one or two or three of the elements of what it's like to be like Jesus, to walk with Jesus to be formed into Jesus' image. Maybe you haven't been spending time in his presence and so you've gotten dry. Your, your work has made you weary. 
and your work has made you weary and you're trying to be more like him and you're working really hard, you try to serve him and you're just tired. It's time to come to me and I will give you rest. If you feel tired and burnt out, maybe you need number one, presence. If you feel like, man, my life doesn't have any purpose, you probably need mission. You need a vision for your life. You'll be depressed. If you feel depressed, you probably don't have mission. You feel burnt out, you probably don't have presence. You feel shallow, unequipped, like you're not enough, you probably need formation. The feelings you feel are usually connected to what you're missing in being a full disciple of Jesus. Burnt out? As a worker, you know? So you get the point, right? Love that picture. John Tyson put all those words together the, in the, the three circles and the three circles within that. And the disciple of Jesus, I borrowed that from him, so phenomenal. But Father, we just ask you to come do this work in us. Would you just respond with me this morning? You can just sit in your seats if you want. I'm just gonna invite the worship team to just come. But would you just ask the Lord, Lord, I heard a lot of things today. What are you speaking to me that I need to shift in my life so that I can be whole? <laughs> in you. Lord, what are you asking me to do? Lord, what are you asking me to be? How do you want to shift my schedule? What's the Lord highlighting today? I want you to just listen to his voice. Let him father you. Be led and taught by the teacher. Let the anointing of God, the presence of God teach you. Father, we just ask that you would do something in us as a community. Do something in us as a community. Let us be a community that sees ourselves formed into the image of Christ fully and others be formed. God, let us see a reversal of, of Gen Z. Not a, not a million falling away, but a million new ones every year coming into the into the kingdom of God, being saved, that, 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 that the harvest, that the, the reaper will overcome even the sower, that even faster than they're being sowed and being birthed, faster than the birth rate on the earth of Gen Z, let salvation be even faster, God, if that's even possible. We just, we, we, we pray and believe, God. Let that be reversed in Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord. Let's just allow the Lord. God, we need you to do this in us, God. We need you to do this in us, God. Make this something that's beyond information, beyond a message, beyond a sermon, God. Do something in us. Do something in us, God. Thank you for joining Kingdom Movement Online. We hope that this message impacted you deeply. Share it with your friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe.